Okay, thanks, Lucy. Uh, well, thank you for everyone who's who's here. Let me just um, move on to the next slide and let's get going. Um, that was the little abstract that I wrote to accompany this presentation, but there is a, a TLDR, too long didn't read or too long didn't listen version to this. When is it okay for students and teachers to use their own language? So the short answer to the question is that it's okay for students and teachers to use their own language if one, it helps them to produce more English or two, uh, it helps them to learn more English. So I'm taking a purely pragmatic view of this. Um, if in some way it helps and it doesn't get in the way, then okay, why, why not allow it? Um, before I go any further though, I should perhaps um, remind you that this doesn't mean that it should be used all the time. When I was a child, was a teenager learning French at school, I had a teacher, and probably you have had very similar teachers who spent most lessons doing one of two things. Either he would be explaining in English the rules of French grammar from our French grammar book, or he would be pointing at various students, you, 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 and asking us to translate uh, little passages, a few sentences at a time of extracts from French literature. So I guess about 95% of those lessons when I was supposed to be learning French were actually in English. And I went through years and years, I went through 14 years of learning French uh, before I could even really say anything very much at all. So I'm not recommending that we return to the days of grammar translation, quite the opposite. Um, I'm suggesting that we can use uh, in, uh, the students or your shared language from time to time in class to help push English acquisition forward. That's the basic line. There are, uh, this, it's a topic which gets people really quite upset that there are people who insist uh, very, very strongly that we should never ever use any other language other than English in the English language classroom. And the reasons for this are the following. People say, for example, that translation is not an important skill. And I think it's true that the kind of translation that I did as a schoolboy, translating little bits, little four or five lines of French literature into either from French into English or English into French is not a very valuable uh, skill to acquire. Um, but that doesn't mean that no translation is an important skill. And I think that in recent years, it's become very clear that if we take a broader picture of what it means to translate, and we use the word mediate, to mediate from one language to another, mediation from one language to another is what we're doing the whole time when we are using a, a shared language, English or whatever it may be. So this idea of mediation, which is now um, in the uh, Common European Framework of Reference, the updated version, is a central skill which learners have to acquire as they shift from one language to uh, another. The second big argument is that any time that we spend using the shared language, the home language, is time that's wasted in a sense because it's time that is not spent using English. But I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and I've seen um, many, many lessons where a teacher is insisting on using English only, but everything that he or she is trying to do simply takes longer uh, because the students can't follow it using only this target language. So I think there are many examples of occasions when using a little bit of the shared language will actually result in more use of English rather than less. The, uh, the other very common reason that's given is that learners need to learn to think in language. Now this is, it, it sort of makes intuitive sense. We, yeah, we kind of feel, we understand where this is coming from, but it's um, not actually the case. We don't tend to think in one language or another. The language of thought is a very, very complicated process. And um, we are using a whole variety of linguistic and non-linguistic resources when we're thinking. I think what we really mean when we say that learners need to think in English is they need to not think at all, that they shouldn't be translating. They shouldn't be thinking first of what they want to say in their own language and then translating it. So what we're talking about here is a kind of proceduralization or automatization of language use um, rather than actually thinking in English. What research there is seems to suggest that in order to think in another language, you would need in any case to have a level of C1 or higher before you can even begin to do that, even though you might think in another language at lower levels for very short stretches. So thinking in English is something which is probably not going to happen anyway and probably doesn't happen in terms of 
the psychological mechanisms that are operating. The fourth, the fourth big reason that I hear mentioned is that if we use translation or we use the other language in the classroom, this promotes fossilization. Uh, that is to say that errors uh, become fixed in various ways and it's very, very difficult to move on beyond those errors. Well, there is quite a lot of research into this uh, and there is no research which indicates that using the shared language does in fact promote fossilization. Fossilization, this kind of fixing of errors um, in, in learners' language production, is something that happens to all learners um, some of the time in all different contexts. So there's no direct connection between using the L1 and fossilization. So those are the four reasons, the most common reasons that are given. And as I've said, I don't think any of them really stand up to inquiry. The fifth reason, which um, is often not quoted, but is often hiding behind it, is a reason um, which is also very problematic. And this fifth reason is that many language teaching methods use English only or the target language only purely for commercial reasons. That is to say, there is a kind of a folk wisdom, a, a generally accepted belief among the population at large that the best way to learn another language is by using only that language. And the commercial angle caters to that belief. It may be the case that you work in an institution where uh, you have no choice and you have to use English only. Um, it may be that there are commercial reasons for this. But I think that when you investigate a little further, you will find that most learners do actually prefer to have a teacher who understands their own language, even if he or she doesn't use it very often. So yeah, the, the commercial reason is sometimes there. Um, it's a problematic reason. Um, and I think we need to think about it a little bit more. I'm certainly not suggesting you start using uh, your shared language with your students if it's going to get you fired from your job, which could be the case in some institutions. If we move uh, quickly away from the reasons for banning the L1 in the classroom for reasons for using it, um, there are some very strong reasons, I think, and I'm going to talk through these quite quickly. The first is the research that's been done. There has been a huge amount of research in the last 20 or 30 years even into the use of um, English only classrooms for learning English or classrooms where the L1 is used from time to time. And the surprising finding from all of this research is that there is plenty of research which indicates that some use of L1 may be beneficial. And examples of this, for example, uh, especially in vocabulary learning at the lower levels, basic uh, memorization of vocabulary, but also at higher levels when students are learning to write um, summaries for, for written purposes, L1 actually helps and there's very strong evidence to suggest that it helps. On the other hand, there is not a single, not one piece of evidence, not one piece of research evidence which indicates that the best way to learn English is only by using English. The research is really quite clear. There are one or two other reasons which are worth considering too, and that is that, uh, the first is the, the, the reasons for learning English. There, there may be all sorts of reasons for learning English and acquiring uh, practical skills in the language is one, but there are other reasons uh, why we're teaching English. I think one of them may be uh, to develop cultural, intercultural understanding. We may also uh, be hoping to develop a positive mindset, for example, or other attributes such as resilience and grit in our learners. And all of these additional objectives in language teaching may actually be better served by, by using the L1 from time to time. If, for example, um, you want to develop your students' critical thinking skills, um, it's almost certainly the case that it's better to do this using the L1 rather than an uh, English if their level is not high enough. The second big reason I think why we need to think seriously about using the L1 in the classroom are the technological changes that are taking place. All of our students, probably without exception, will be using things like Google Translate, whether we like it or not. They'll probably be using digital dictionaries. They may be using um, automatic captions when they're watching videos, and they may be using the translation option on these automatic captions. One of the things that we know about most learners is that although they like using technology to help their language learning, they don't use it very well. 
And there are certainly ways in which we can help them to use digital dictionaries, bilingual digital dictionaries, or Google Translate, or captioning. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to help them with the technology, then we need to bring it into the classroom. A couple of other points before we move on to the, the more practical side of things. Um, one of the biggest problems, I suppose, in, in learning anything, but particularly learning a language, is you feel such a fool at the lower levels when you're doing it. And we ask in language classes, we ask our students to be creative, imaginative, and to express personal meanings. And we ask them typically to do this from a very, very low level. It is extremely difficult to be creative or imaginative in another language when you have a level of A2 or B1 or even a B1 plus level. So allowing some kind of uh, occasional use of the L1, the shared language, if there is a shared language, makes sense in terms of buildings learn, building learners' confidence. And this is reflected quite clearly when we ask learners what their preferences are. Would they prefer their teacher only ever to use English? Or would they prefer their teacher to use the L1 from time to time? Would they prefer to be allowed to use L1 when they feel that that's the only way they can express something? Or should we somehow um, restrict them? And again, the research that's been done here is very, very clear. Not all, but the majority of learners in most contexts, and especially younger learners, would prefer to be allowed to use the shared language, L1, from time to time, and they would prefer it if their teacher understood the language uh, which they share with them. This is maybe surprising, because it often seems that um, learners would prefer to have a monolingual British, American, Australian, whatever teacher who can't speak the other language. But when we turn around and ask students, it seems that this is not the case. They would actually prefer somebody with a high level of English who shares their language. So again, a, a fairly strong reason for allowing some use of L1 in the classroom. The last reason is simply one of efficiency. At lower levels especially, the kinds of things that we can do, the kinds of activities that we can set up are fairly limited if we can't give occasional instructions in the shared language in L1. Um, any kind of a role play is kind of tricky to set up unless you've got enough language to understand the instructions. So it may well, may well be just a case of efficiency that from time to time, just actually saying things quickly in the language which everybody understands may lead to much, much more productive use of English in the rest of the lesson. And the same, I think, is true in terms of occasional uh, instruction in both vocabulary and grammar, making contrasts between the languages, the languages which students are learning and the language they already understand and speak may save us an awful lot of time. It is um, extremely tricky to teach some things without um, translating. Many years ago, when I was teaching in Spain, I was observing a teacher and he was trying to explain the difference between um, goat and sheep. And he tried drawing it on the board, but his drawing skills were not really good enough to differentiate between what a goat looked like and what a sheep looked like. So he tried doing it by making sounds, but of course the sound that a goat makes and the sound that a sheep makes is fairly similar and there are cultural differences in the way that we represent those sounds in different languages. So this poor guy, you know, he was being observed by me, his director of studies, was desperately trying to do it when all he needed to do was to quickly provide a translation of these two words, goat and sheep, into, into Spanish, and then we would have moved on. In the end, the whole thing took about 10 minutes and the class ended up, they, these were young children, the class ended up rolling around the floor laughing at this guy's attempts to draw pictures on the board. And he eventually um, realized that he had to go into translation Unfortunately, his Spanish was not good enough, and he, he used the word um, cabron rather than cabra to explain the word goat, which meant that the class was laughing even more. So simply in terms of efficiency, um, it may simply make sense to, to use the L1 from time to time. So those are, those are the reasons, and I want now to move on to the, the practical side of it, which is um, perhaps the most important side of it. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to 
I'm going to illustrate the points that I make by referring to um, one lesson. It's a fairly randomly chosen lesson from Studio Intermediate. And I think uh, that Lucy has sent you a, a link where you can look at a, a PDF of this lesson. It's lesson 6C from Studio Intermediate. But as I say, it's a fairly random lesson and you don't need to have it. Uh, the links come up. You can have a look at this as I'm, as I'm talking. But don't worry if, if you're not looking at it right now or if you've got too much going on on your screen. I'm not going to go through the lesson uh, stage by stage. I'm simply going to dip into various parts of the lesson uh, to suggest when I might use uh, the L1. And I've divided this into three teaching techniques, three fairly basic teaching techniques, one learning activity and one uh, teaching activity. I think in many ways that it's the techniques that define our teaching. I know that when I do teacher training sessions, people often want a handout, they want a new activity to try out. But it's often the, the more basic stuff in our teaching techniques which characterizes our approach. Um, and that's why I want to focus on those more than providing you with lots and lots of different activities. So three teaching techniques, one learning activity, one tool and one teaching activity. The um, first of these basic techniques we need rules. We need rules in the classroom to de determine, to, to establish what language can be spoken and when and by whom. If we attempt to uh, say English only, English only, which is what many teachers do, the chances are that you'll end up spending half of the time just simply saying, say it in English, say it in English, say it in English. And I think if we recognize from the start that there are going to be times when uh, learners are going to need and want to speak their own language or use a bilingual dictionary or something like that. If we acknowledge that from the start, it may be a more real, a realistic proposition. One system that I've used is uh, on the board, but you can do this also with little uh, tags on, on, on a screen if you're teaching online, is to have, this is, uh, these flags here represent German above and English underneath. So I have two of these. And I when I stick the uh, English flag symbol up on the board, this means that only English is acceptable at that point. When I stick the other flag on the board, uh, it simply means that uh, either language can be used. And I'll break this up and at different points in a lesson, uh, I'll have one flag showing or, or the other one. It's a very simple little device. Some teachers I've seen do this quite effectively by uh, standing in different places in the classroom. So when they stand at the front, for example, this means that people can use whichever language they like, or they move to the side of the classroom near the door, for example, and when they're in that position, then only English is used. I mean, you can work out your own uh, rules here, but I think that we need to have uh, clear rules from the start and those rules need to be flexible. Having rules doesn't mean, of course, that uh, students aren't going to break the rules and you'll still find yourself saying, say it in English, please say it in English. One way of being more flexible is to use what I, well, I, it's a system of ticks. It's a credit system, basically. In any class, and depending upon the level and the age and the length of the lesson, you can choose how many ticks you want to use. I've given three as an example here, but we'll have these as little pieces of card or paper somewhere near the front of the room. What happens is that whenever anyone in the class wants to use their own language, they have to use one of these ticks. So they go to the front or they put up the hand or whatever, and one of these ticks is removed. This means that the more often that people try to speak their own or want to speak their own language, the fewer ticks, the fewer credits are available. And if at the beginning of a class people start speaking a lot of the L1, then these ticks are going to be used up very, very quickly. And the experience that I've had is that classes will start to monitor, they'll start to police themselves. So that as this pile of ticks decreases, uh, other students in the class will now try it in English, try it in English, try it in English, as they monitor how much uh, L1 is being used. The same system uh, can be used also in group work. In group work, it's very hard, of course, uh, to monitor what every group is saying, or well, especially if it's pair work where it's even harder and you have to move around the room. And if it's on Zoom, it's practically impossible to move around at the speed that you need. 
But one way of getting around this is that before group work or pair work begins, you tell each group or pair that they have a certain number of L1 credits and that each time that they want to speak this uh, L1, they can do so, but they're going to be using up one of the credits to do so. Again, what happens in the group work and the pair work is um, that they end up policing themselves. So although there's always going to be a need from time to time for the teacher to say, speak English, speak English, speak English, this actually, you in most classes, not all, uh, this has the effect of getting the students to do it themselves and uh, making it less of, a, less of a hassle for you to remind people to speak English the whole time. <coughs> As, a, as an accompaniment, Anna, what's the word, an accompaniment to uh, these rules, I'd also suggest uh, that um, you monitor or somebody monitors the instances in a class where the other language, the L1, is being used. When I started doing this, um, I started taking notes myself, um, and I used to do this on the board. So I used to have one side of the board where I would, um, when somebody said something in French when I was living in, in French speaking countries or Spanish when I was speaking in Spanish countries I'd write up on the board what it was that they'd said um, and I would then use this uh, information later on so we'd have a little correction slot not a uh, correction translation slot if you like these are these are the things that I heard people saying they said it in their L1 well let's look at it together and let's work out how you can say this in English so it could be that towards the end we've got a, a column of, of bits of sometimes single words, sometimes phrases, sometimes sentences, a column of bits of the L1 on the board, and I could wrap up the lesson in the last 10 minutes by putting people into pairs or into small groups, and they work together to uh, work out how to render this, these bits of language into English. And you can choose how you want to do this. I mean, and I see no reason, um, if it's okay in your institution, why they can't actually use um, bilingual dictionaries or even something like Google Translate to check out how these things can be said. Although writing that amount of stuff on the board is, is time consuming and when you're doing it, of course, it's difficult to be aware of what's going on in the rest of the class. So I, I shifted in the end, um, although I still occasionally take notes of this kind, I shifted and I started nominating individual students as the language monitors. The easiest way of doing this is, is probably in, um, in group work. So if students are working in groups of four or five, one student's role is simply to be the language monitor. And their job is not to participate in English in the discussion, it's simply to write down in the L1 anything that they hear said in the L1. And this means that they tend to end up being kind of police officers as well, because if there's too much German or Spanish or French or whatever, um, that then they will say, wait, wait, slow down, start speaking English, because they can't transcribe it fast enough. So it's a, it's a useful way of um, changing the roles in, in group work. And then at the end of the group activity, the student who's been taking the notes uh, shares that with the rest of the group. And again, they work together to work out how these things that had been said in L1 could have been said in English. What I like about this, of course, is, is that what we're doing here is we're working out ways of saying things which they actually wanted to say. So it's, not, it's no longer the teacher telling students what it is they need to learn in English. It's something that they actually wanted to say themselves in, in the first place. So having language monitors operating in groups is a technique I recommend you uh, to try out. And you might, it depends on the size of the class, you might uh, also try it out in the whole class so when the teacher's at the front, taking questions from wherever or contributions from the whole class, you may have one student, again, working as a language monitor, different student every lesson, obviously. One student works as a language monitor, and when something is said in the L1, their job is to, is to take a note, and then um, we look at it together afterwards. So this is the first kind of basic technique. We need to have clear language rules and rules that will work. Um, although we need to be flexible and we need to have language monitors uh, to, to check what is being said in L1. And I think that these rules and these, uh, the role of the language monitor would evolve over the course of a, a term or a semester or even longer. At the beginning, I think it's important and necessary to be more tolerant, otherwise you get no contributions at all. 
uh, as we uh, get to know the class better, as they get to understand the rules of the classroom better, and they get to know each other better, then we can tighten the rules and we can go for uh, a much greater amount of English production. So that's my first basic technique, language rules and language monitors. Um, I move on. Sandwiching. Now, Sam, you don't need to look at the, uh, the examples in, in the slide here for the moment. Sandwiching has been described as the single most valuable technique that a language teacher can possibly have. Although it's a technique that I see occasionally, but not all that often. In the sandwiching technique. Basically what you do as a teacher is you speak English most of the time, but when you need to say something which you know the students won't understand in English, you provide a translation in ein uh, Übersetzung in German and then repeat in English. So you provide a translation, Übersetzung, translation, and then carry on in English. Now this little sandwiching technique, remember, so you, you say it in English first, provide the translation, it could be a single word, it could easily be a phrase, and then repeat it in English, is something, is, is a way of introducing huge amounts of language. This is for any level, um, any age. You can introduce huge amounts of language in this way. And one of the funny things about this is that it's often the case, in my experience, the students learn more language from your sandwiching than they do from what it is you're trying to teach sometimes. When then would you use sandwiching? Well, the first example I'd like to give is, is I'm taking this lesson from uh, Studio Intermediate. This, this lesson begins with a, with a pair work, uh, a speaking activity, pair work activity, where students talk about friends and friendship with questions like, how many friends do you have? What do you like about your friends? Um, is it possible to be good friends with people who are very different from you? These kinds of questions. Now, an activity like that um, is fine to kick off a class with many classes, but with some classes, especially classes that are not used to each other or used to you, it may make more sense for the teacher to give an example of the sorts of language that we want the students to produce first. So in this particular lesson, one way of beginning it would be for the teacher to start by saying, OK, I'm going to ask you in a minute to talk about friends and friendships. But first, I'm going to tell you a few things about my friends. And you begin by giving some personal information about your friends as a kind of model for the students. So it, in a moment like that, there are almost certainly things that you are going to want to uh, translate or sandwich. I might, for example, want to talk about um, one of my closest friends who's an entomologist. Well, entomologist is a word that may be understandable in, as a cognate in some languages, but it may simply be necessary to translate it uh, if the word is not cognate. So I'd simply say, I want to talk about my friend, Mickey, who's an entomologist. I translate it, repeat it, and then move on. So sandwiching can be used at any moment when the teacher is talking, but perhaps, perhaps the most common is when we're giving instructions. I said earlier that it's difficult to set up some activities um, when we're using English only for the instructions. Now, teachers use a variety of, of techniques for doing this. Um, sometimes they'll say it in English and then repeat the whole thing in the shared language and then say it again in English. But I think that if you repeat the whole thing in the L1, then students learn very quickly not to listen to the bits when you're actually speaking English. So sandwiching just bits of it um, is going to encourage students to listen to you producing English far more. And I'll give one example. Um, this is the, the fifth bullet point here. Look at whatever, the picture in the book or the exercise. Look at exercise three. Match the words in bold to the definitions below. Now, my guess is that some students will not know, uh, at a certain level, will not know the word. I'm sorry, my dog is barking. I can't stop him. Uh, some students will not know the word or the phrase in bold. So again, uh, I would simply translate this little bit. Match the words in bold, en gras in French, in bold to the definitions below. And just translating that little sandwiched bit is almost certainly enough um, for people to get the, the meaning of what you want. 
I think you can introduce uh, a lot of language like this. I mean, when you look at these, these are very, very common um, instructions for, for, for activities. The verbs are almost always the same, match, complete, label, uh, replace, choose, complete, and so on. And we can introduce this from a very, very low level. Um, and I'd like to suggest a, a related technique um, using these translations or translations of instructions. As I, this is an example in German, as I uh, introduce new bits of instructional language, important bits of instructional language, I get uh, one student in the class to write it on, this is a fairly large piece of paper, uh, yeah, about this kind of size, so that it's visible from a distance. And I prefer to do it on pieces of paper which I can then stick onto a board or onto a wall using a sticky tape or, or with uh, sticky gum. So I get them to, to write uh, the instruction. I tell them, will you write this down, get into pairs when it's a low level. And I tell them once they've understood it, also to do a separate piece of paper with the German translation, in this case, Bildet Power. So this is a, a list of really basic instructions. And I leave these, I leave these on the wall. This means that when I give this instruction uh, in a later lesson, some students will choose to look at the wall to check that they've understood what it means, but then I start playing with it. So I might wait a couple of lessons, by which stage I would hope that people are happy understanding an expression like get into pairs. But the, the translation equivalent pieces of paper before the lesson, I jumble them up and I mix them all up and I put them in, in, in the wrong order. I may begin the lesson by saying to the students, look at the, look at the board over here with these instructions and get somebody to come to the front and rearrange them. Or I may wait until somebody actually notices and then there will be the activity of rearranging. So this simply acts as a, as a, as a memory device, a, a reminder of how these, what these things mean. The advantage too of doing this, this, this bilingual approach on pieces of paper like this is that when you're absolutely convinced that um, they're, they're happy with a particular phrase for instructions, you can simply remove it altogether and you can continue adding others to it. One of the things that I think is, is quite interesting is that there's a lot of very useful language that we don't introduce in most course books until quite late, until B2 or C1. And an example of that is, is a, a cleft structure, something like what I want you to do is, which is a very, very common piece of teacher instructional language. What I want you to do is. Now we don't teach it until later on because we think that cleft sentences are uh, too high level, but there's absolutely no reason why even at much, much lower levels, even B1, B1 plus, we couldn't begin by introducing little phrases like what I want you to do is, or what you're going to do next is. Get them written on little pieces of paper, get the translations next to them, play around, revise, shuffle it around. And in this way, clefts, basic cleft phrases, little uh, entrance frames, if you like, can be introduced at a very low level. And this is very, very useful language, not just for understanding the teacher, but uh, also when the students are working in class and doing things outside of the class. So I'm taking the sandwiching technique a, a little bit further forward here by, by using this um, bilingual in approach to instructions. Okay, I'm moving on, what's next? Um, the, the next technique, so this is the third of my, of my techniques, is what I call own language moments or L1 moments. I've suggested earlier that there are almost always times in the class where it's just, you, you need a break. Even in a, in a 40 minute lesson, trying to speak English and listen to English for 40 minutes is a challenge for most learners, especially at lower levels. At some point, you know, your concentration is going to snap and it may be just valuable to, <coughs> excuse me, to just have a little break, a few minutes in your own language. Um, one example of this is in speaking activities. Even when a speaking activity is one that you know works well, you try it with another class and for some reason it doesn't work so well. Maybe it's because it's the end of the week or the students are not feeling so positive or not so constructive or they're just tired. I found that um, one way of getting a, 
speaking activity going when it's not working terribly well um, is to stop it in the middle. I simply clap my hands loudly like that. And I say to the class, right, continue the activity, but continue it in your own language. And the reaction to this is usually one of shock. Oh, what, what's going on? I say, yeah, come on, just carry on in your own language. When I've done this a few times, they become used to my little trick. I let them speak their own language for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and then boom, clap my hands again, and we go back into English. And this little break, it's just a, a breather, a, a pause mechanism, if you like, is often enough to get a, language, a speaking, a fluency speaking activity going. The other time uh, when speaking activities don't work is often not in the middle, but at the beginning. People find it very, very hard sometimes just to kick off in English. I mean, I think the golden rule here is that before any fluency speaking activity, we give, we give learners some time to think silently about what it is that they're going to say, prepare in advance. But silent preparation time um, doesn't always work because when you say to a, a class, you've got, let's say one minute, two minutes to think about what you're going to say in answer to the questions here, for example, often they don't spend the time thinking about it. They just switch their brains off. So I think that you should always try to give some silent preparation time before a fluency activity, but an alternative to it or an addition to it is to do it in the following way. This is a, a, a pair work activity. Give them some time to think about the answers to the questions first, and then tell them to work with a partner and to do it first in their own language and give them a time limit. I mean, something like this in your own language should not take more than two or three minutes. And they do it in, the, in, in their own language first. When it's finished, we change the pairs. So they're now working with a different partner. And this time they repeat the activity, but this time they have to do it in English. And the advantage of this approach is that they've had time to rehearse it, if you like, in their own language, which means that when they get to the English version of it, they have plenty to say. So they, they don't have to kind of divide their brains between thinking about the content of what they're saying and the language they're trying to express it in. They've already got the content because they've explored it. They can devote much, much more attention to um, the English language, which they need to express it with. So this idea of task repetition um, is uh, a fairly basic one in, in terms of language acquisition. Um, and I think you can sometimes usefully bring the L1 into it. I, I saw a quick question there. I can't look at the questions all the time. Um, is it a good idea to ask them to write down their answers? No, it's not a good idea to, to write down the answers for the simple reason that if they've written down the answers, it will take a long, long time to write. They'll also tend to worry about the accuracy of their writing. This is a speaking activity. They'll worry too much about the accuracy of their writing. And then when it comes to the speaking, they won't speak they will uh, read aloud and that's not really what we want. So I would strongly recommend not to write down anything beforehand, unless your students are used to just writing down a few key words, just a few notes, that will be fine. But uh, the, the, the danger is always that they're gonna try to write too much and then the activity will go on forever. So own language moments, uh, I think have a, an important role to play in, um, in the management of, of speaking tasks. And there is this paradox that I'm suggesting uh, that using the L1 may actually lead to a lot more production of English. And that, after all, is what we're attempting to achieve. There are other times, too. Um, I guess every language teacher's role involves grammar explanation. And one of the interesting things about grammar explanation that we know from research uh, into classrooms around the world is that most teachers tend to switch into their own language, the shared language when they're explaining grammar. I'm not sure that this is um, either necessary or, or a good thing, but I'm not sure, I'm not saying it's bad or I'm not saying it's good. Um, I think that very often the, the grammar explanations in course books, which have been tried and tested and piloted and edited many, many times and have been produced uh, by experienced writers and editors and so on are often much better than the, the lengthy explanations that many teachers give or certainly the teachers that I used to have as a 
French student. But I think there is a moment to think about the use of uh, the first language when it comes to grammar instruction. I would personally prefer, uh, when possible, to use English only for explaining grammar rules, although I think that there is a time when we want to contrast um, structures in one language, uh, in the target language, English, with a similar but not quite the same structure in the, in the shared language. But what I would like to suggest is, is a fairly simple activity. However you approach um, the teaching of grammatical rules, the probability is that students will remember this kind of declarative information, rule information, better in their own language than in the target language. So a very simple activity, and this is a follow-up to any kind of grammar explanation and practice that you do, is that at the end of the lesson, you ask the class to imagine, and it may be it's true, that one or more students has been absent from the class and their job is to imagine that they now have to explain this grammar to the absent student when the student returns, or perhaps they're gonna do this uh, online or on, on the telephone later on. And of course, when they explain grammar rules to uh, a peer, a colleague, they're gonna do this in their own language. And research seems to suggest that when you repeat rules of this kind in your own language, um, you're more likely to remember it than if you attempt to reproduce the rules in your own language. So it's the act of teaching or imagining that you're teaching uh, may help the memorization. It's something which I think is worth exploring. Um, there are many other moments, I think, when uh, the shared language may be used. It may be, for example, that an appropriate response to a, a reading uh, text or a listening text is rather than answering comprehension questions, is to get students to summarize it in their own language. And this as an interlanguage inter mediation activity is something which we are likely to see more of. And some countries, um, Greece I think is one, but I think there are others, Poland is another, where this is an activity which is now assessed in formal exams um, at uh, mature or higher, higher levels. So the whole value of, of using the own language from time to time is up to you to explore, um, but there are many ways in which you can do it. <clears throat> okay, vocabulary learning. Now, this, is a, this is a scan from this lesson 6C where we're teaching uh, a set of vocabulary related to friendship. And you can see I, 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 I developed a mind map to do this. And I think that a mind map is a, use, a very useful uh, memory device for remembering things. Um, but one, one of the things that, again, we've learned from research is that we don't have one part of the brain where the English words are stored and another part of the brain where the, the equivalents in one's own language are stored. These are mixed together in, in very complicated networks in the brain. When you see a word um, like, uh, let's take one of these here, admire, um, also when we have a brain scan, all sorts of different parts of the brains are going to be uh, lighting up. And we know that when you uh, see a, a word in the language you're learning, like admire, that it is likely to activate in your subconscious the equivalent in your own language. And now that might be the same in French, admire is the same word, but in other languages is very different. The conclusion from this, and this has been tested quite a lot at lower levels with high frequency words, and these are all high frequency expressions, is that it makes sense to uh, promote memorization of vocabulary at the initial stages of learning words by using bilingual um, tools. The most obvious way of doing this is by using flashcards, the old fashioned flashcards with the uh, English um, target on one side and then on the other side of the card, a, a translation into the student's own language. Even better, I think, than the old fashioned card flashcards are the new digital flashcards. Many of these are free. Uh, systems like Quizlet, where you can write in your own words, devise sets for the whole class. Um, many students like them, not all students like them, it has to be said. Um, but, um, but if you've not experimented with flashcards, vocabulary flashcards, bilingual flashcards with your class, I highly recommend it. In some countries, in Germany, for example, flashcards are, are strongly recommended and you get something like 75% of, of younger learners uh, from about eight or nine upwards to school leaving using bilingual flashcards. 
they're worth checking out, they're worth experimenting with. You need to spend some time in class encouraging your students to use them. Um, some, of course, won't. They'll just never open up the app or never look at their cards. But the research on this is fairly clear. For initial vocabulary learning, um, bilingual techniques work better. By the time we get to a higher levels, C1 and C2, the bilingual system isn't really necessary. And I'm not really sure that learning from flashcards at C1 or C2 is the way to go about vocabulary learning anyway. A more useful way of spending your time is by spending a lot of time reading or watching videos, caption videos, whatever it may be. So this is a, a fundamental learning activity which all students should know about and they should be encouraged to use. Bilingual learning for low um, level, high frequency words and phrases that they need. And I'm sorry, my dog is still barking. I'm not sure what, what's got into him. Okay, let's move on. Um, the, the tool that I recommend more than any other is Google Translate. Now I know that Google Translate has its problems, but Google Translate has um, e evolved over the years. If your first language is uh, Spanish, for example, the accuracy of Spanish to English and English to Spanish translations in Google Translate is now very high. It depends on the text. I mean, clearly, if you're if you're translating uh, something literary, poetry, pop song, the translation is not going to be so good. But for most basic kinds of texts, Google Translate is now extremely accurate for language pairing pairings such as um, Spanish English. But it's pretty rubbish when it comes to other pairings such as um, Serbian English or um, or Macedonian English. And the reason for this is that the system works on, on, a, on a huge computerized database of parallel texts. Between Spanish and English and between Chinese and English, the system can uh, refer to a huge, huge corpus. And this means, because it's all about the statistical probability of, of things translating one way or another. Uh, and this means that the accuracy is pretty high. With other languages, the accuracy is, is very low. So the way that you use Google Translate is going to depend quite a bit on the accuracy uh, of, of Google Translate itself. Um, whichever level of accuracy there is, I think that Google Translate has some features which uh, are not so well known and, um, and ought to be better known. I strongly recommend uh, a video by Russell Stannard. I've um, put the, the link in here, but you can simply uh, go into YouTube and uh, Google, uh, put it on a search function. Russell Stannard, Google Translate will bring it up fairly quickly. And Russell looks at the use of Google Translate, not for translating texts, but he uses it mostly um, for either translating individual words, because um, m most of the time Google Translate will offer more than one possibility for individual words. It also offers you the possibility of listening um, repeatedly to uh, an English speaking person saying these words. So it's very good for listening practice, for pronunciation practice of individual words. But it also enables you to export the words that you look at um, into um, a, uh, a spreadsheet, for example, or a, or a Word document, which you can then put into a flashcard system. So he's recommending Google Translate really for study of individual words, individual vocabulary, and I think it makes sense. Um, but if the, uh, if the language that your students speak um, is pretty rubbish with Google Translate, then I think we need to give them some help in um, being critical about how it works. Now, this slide here shows the, um, the typical problems that Google Translate has moving from English to any other language or any other language to English. And even languages like German, which are not too bad, has a big, big problem, um, German English, when it comes to things like object pronouns and articles. It has big, big problems with um, cultural references. It simply doesn't recognize them. Um, and this is true of, of, of all uh, speech to text systems. My daughter, who's bilingual, is, is, is using um, the, the, the speech to text search function when she's looking for stuff online. But because she's bilingual, sometimes she says it in English and sometimes she says it in German. And because my phone is, is set with English settings, she's still struggling to understand 
um, that uh, she can only use English when she's doing it. Uh, somebody here has just said that uh, DeepL is better than Google Translate. Yes, I, I agree. For the and Google um, has so many languages. DeepL has fewer languages, DeepL, but it is growing all of the time. And when you have a choice, uh, DeepL is more accurate. But there may be some value in using a bad translation tool like Google Translate as a way of training, um, as a way of training learners to. Uh, understand its limitations. And, and the, a very simple way of doing this is to give them a text of some kind, translate it into their own language, and then you as a teacher, before you show them this, underline or highlight the things that it's got wrong. Uh, and we, we can train them in this way in recognizing the, the translation limitations. And it tends to be one of the 10 things that I've done here. Um, so that when they do use Google Translate or DeepL Translate, um, they use it in a more critical way. So actually using the bad translations um, is one way of training them um, quite productively, I find. Um, it's a bit like using, you know, the bad translations, um, I don't know, restaurant menus that have been used badly. So Google Translate is something which uh, needs to be explored. Um, I'd like to conclude with one simple activity. It's called reverse translation. In reverse translation, we start with the text in English, a text which in some way the students are familiar with, and we ask the students to translate it into their own language. It should be short. Obviously, we're not talking about 12 or 15 lines of text. Three or four lines is usually more than enough. This could be a, a text which they've already looked at, a part of a reading text in class. Uh, it could be anything of intrinsic interest. It could be something which you want to do to set up a topic at the beginning. But it could also be grammar and vocabulary exercises and it could be a model text. So if you're preparing students uh, for writing, I don't know, let's say um, they're taking an exam such as Cambridge First, uh, where there's a writing component and you've got a model text, they could take a part of this model text. So we start by asking them to translate this into their own language. And I usually do this almost always as a collaborative activity, a paired activity, uh, where they can share resources with each other. So they translate it into their own language. You then take their translation, the pieces of paper with their translations away. In a later lesson, or possibly at the much, much later in the same lesson, you give these texts back to the students who wrote them. And their job is now to translate it back into English. It's as simple as that. I prefer normally to wait until, until the subsequent lesson. I mean, as an example for this, this is this is a, a mini text which is used to set up the topic in this lesson. It's about the right length. Um, so we'd start early on in the lesson. Students translate this into their own language. I take away the translation. They do the rest of the lesson. And at the very end of the lesson, again, as a collaborative activity, they translate it back. Students will be desperate to open their course books to check the accuracy of their translation. You've got to be very, very uh, tight and controlled. Nobody's allowed to open their course book until you say so. But there is something quite um, rich and exciting about students actually wanting to open a course book, um, even if it is just a cheat. So um, that would be one example. I could do the same in this lesson. This is a little activity where we're practicing so and such. They're gonna do this earlier in the lesson after they've done it as a useful way of reminding the way that so and such works in English, translating is a good way to do it. Come back to it later, get them to translate it back into English. That's all.